We're turning to Proverbs chapter 3 this morning, a very important passage, a very important passage of Scripture. We'll give you just a moment. We're going to walk through some of these Scriptures today, and I've titled the message, Walking in the Wisdom of God, but I want to add something to that. Walking in the Wisdom of God, Conditions and Blessings. So Proverbs chapter 3, I'm going to read, we'll, we'll tool through some of this today beyond this, but I want to read the first 12 verses, and all of us listening closely to the word of the Lord. We, we reverence and we worship God in his word right now. We, we want to hear what the Lord says to us today in teaching. Here's the word of the Lord. My son, do not forget my teaching, but keep my commands in your heart, for they will prolong your life many years and bring you peace and prosperity. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Then you will win favor and a good name. In the sight of God and man, trust in the Lord with all of your heart, with all your heart, and lean not to your own understanding. In all of your ways, submit to him. Some translations say, acknowledge him. Let me just comment on that a moment in passing, because I don't know if I'll come back to it. It's very important that we live our lives in the acknowledgement of God every moment, every day. You know, we can say we're Christians, but I've met Christians that are almost like practical atheists. They say they're Christians, but in parts of their lives, they don't even acknowledge God. They hardly even worship God. It's important, and I like this translation here. It says, again, in all of your ways, submit to him. And he will make your paths straight or or smooth. Let's read on. Do not be wise in your own eyes. Fear the Lord and shun evil. This will bring health to your body and nourishment to your bones. Honor the Lord with your wealth, with the first fruits of all of your crops. Then your barns will be filled to overflowing. And your vats will brim with new wine. My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline. And do not resent his rebuke. Because the Lord disciplines those he loves. As a father, the son that he delights in. Father, today I ask that you would bless this time in your word. Bless this study today. Bless this teaching today. I pray that you'd apply it to each of our hearts, especially, Lord, we pray for Dakota today. As I've known him most of his life, and now as a young man, I pray that you would guide and lead and direct him in your great wisdom. And, Lord, direct all of us in your wisdom. We need the wisdom that you give, Father, Father. We pray you would bless our words today. Let it bring fruit unto eternal life. And we ask it in Jesus' great name. Everyone said amen. Amen. Walking in the wisdom of God. Conditions and blessings. When we go to Proverbs chapter 3, normally we don't start in verse 1, do we? Normally we don't start in verse 12 or verse 11 or verse 26. Normally when we go to Proverbs 3, we go to those verses that I memorized when I was a a young Christian. We go to verse 5 and 6. It's kind of the the key. It's one of the anchored scriptures, one of the key thoughts that the Holy Spirit gives us here. Trust in the Lord with all of your heart. Lean not to your own understanding in all your ways. Acknowledge him. Submit to him. And, And he will direct your paths. And that's certainly a wonderful Two, two wonderful passages of Scripture. But we have to acknowledge those are not the only two verses in that chapter. They're like 30, what is there, 30, 
32, 30. There's 35 verses in this chapter. Certainly, we need the guidance of the Lord. Certainly, Dakota needs the guidance of the Lord. We, I, as a pastor and leadership team here in the church, we need the guidance of the Lord. You and your family need the guidance of the Lord. And we look at that promise. And, and by the way, that is a promise. The Lord does want to guide us. The, lo- the Lord wants to make our path smooth, moving out those obstacles to his plan, purpose, and will. But, but what we have to also realize and acknowledge that there are not only promises in this chapter, but there are also conditions in this chapter. Let me just mention this as I, as I move on into these thoughts today, and that is this. The Lord wants to guide you into his blessing, and his guidance is unfailing. His guidance is perfect. One of my favorite parts of a verse in the, in the entirety of the Bible is three little words. It's in 1 Corinthians 1, 9. It says this, God is faithful. Now, we're not always faithful. People around us may not be faithful. We may, be, we may be even disappoint ourselves, but we serve a God who's absolutely perfect in all of his ways, and his guidance is perfect. And we want to follow his guidance because I've read, I've read even just a portion of the scripture. And when you look at these blessings, you go, you should say, I want this in my life. I want these blessings in my life. But the question is, how do we, how do we get these blessings? How, how, does, how do these blessings of Proverbs chapter 3 get off the pages into our lives in 2022? How, how do we experience these in a personal way? And that's why I've titled this message, Walking in the Wisdom of God, Conditions and Blessings. So what I want to look at first is some of the conditions that the Lord has given us here that we can walk in the fullness of his blessing, four conditions, four blessings. And isn't the word of God just amazing? Here's the first condition. If we're going to walk in the wisdom and the blessing of the Lord, it's found in the first four verses. And I would just capsulize it by saying this. If we're going to walk in God's guidance, we have to know the truth. We have to know the word of God. We have to know what God's plan, purpose, and will is for each of our lives. And where do we find that? We find that in the very word of God, this precious treasure that we have here before us on this pulpit, and it is the very word of God today. Many, many churches are getting away from the word of God. Many Christians are getting away. Whole denominations are going away from the word of God to human philosophy, but oh no, a million times no, we're going to cling to the truth of God. We need to learn the truth of God. God is has revealed this. This was one of Paul's prayers in Colossians 1. Listen to this great verse. I've read this a lot in the last year. For some reason, I've taught on it, but I want to read it to you. Colossians 1, verses 9 and 10 says this. Paul says, for this reason, since the day I heard about you. What he's talking about is the day he heard that there was people who got saved in Colossae. He heard they gave their lives to the Lord. A little church had gathered there. And what is the first thing Paul prayed for them? What was his desire for them? He said, I have not stopped praying for you. We continually ask that God may fill you with the knowledge of his will through through all the wisdom and the understanding that the Spirit gives so that you may live a life worthy of the Lord and please him in every way, bearing fruit in every good work, growing in the knowledge of God. What did Paul pray for these new believers? He he prayed that they would have God's wisdom, that they would know God's will. Do you know God has wisdom for every part of our lives? We're not left just to be like a ship adrift at sea. We have an anchor for the soul. Hebrews talks about that. The anchor is the very word of God. One One of God's anchors is his word. He has given us his knowledge and his will for the human race. We know why we were created. We were created to bring glory to the Lord. We were created to be his image bearers. And because of the fall in Genesis 3, that image has been marred. And we look at our confused world today. But I don't have to choose to live in a confused world. I don't have to choose the the nonsense and the philosophies of humanism, but I choose Jesus today. Amen? Dakota, do you choose Jesus today? Do you choose his will and his plan today? Paul prays that they would know the wisdom of God. Paul prays that they would live a life worthy 
of the Lord Jesus Christ. So how do we get God's wisdom? Well, I can tell you, this wisdom that I'm talking about today is not like the pebbles on the ground. I could walk outside and I could pick up enough pebbles to fill my trunk up. But I dare to say none of us could go out there and find any gold. Well, that'd be a little harder, wouldn't it? It's a little harder to find gold. That's why many never find it in their whole lifetime, because you've got to dig for this gold. The Bible says in 2 Timothy 2.15, it says, Be diligent to study to show yourself approved unto God, a workman that needeth not to be ashamed, rightly dividing the word of truth. This gold, and it is gold, by the way, it's worth, this gold I'm talking about is worth more than all the gold in Fort Knox, if there's any in there anymore. Who knows? This is the spiritual gold of who God is. It's the truth of who we are in him. It's the truth of what we are and what we're going to be. It's filled with prophecies and promises and plans and, and precious songs. And it's filled with historical stories. And it teaches us about who God is. It teaches us why the world is like it is today. It teaches us how to know God. We're, we're about to get in a series in Romans, and my mind is about to you know, do this. It's, it's a very wonderful truth, but we've got to concentrate. And, and I hope you'll make it, but some of you won't make it because, because it's, it's harder than narrative. But it's, it's the most amazing book, the book of Romans. And really what Romans is about, it's the treasure of the significance. What is the significance of the death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus? What does that mean? Romans unpacks that for us. What an amazing book. But you get this gold by diligent, hard, mental work. See, because what's happened in our modern day is we chase feelings. You say, oh, no, we don't. No, we don't. Yes, we do. I've been around the church for decades. I can tell you, yes, we do. We may do it inadvertently, but yes, we do. We chase feelings. We judge everything by how it makes us feel. We judge the sermon. We judge the song. We judge the whatever. In the, we, we judge it all by how it makes us feel. That's not what we should be chasing. We should chase obedience. We should chase a life following the wisdom of God, being fully pleasing to the Lord. Run after obedience no matter how it makes you feel. When Jesus hung on the cross, how do you think he felt? Nails in his hands, nails in his feet, thorn pressed down upon his brow. But he said, Father, I do always those things that you tell me to do. Not my will, but let yours be done. Jesus wanted to follow the will of God, and we find the will of God in the wisdom of God. We find, the, find it in the word of God. Psalm 119, 30, 130 says, the entrance of your word gives light. It gives us understanding to the simple. If you don't know what to do, open your Bible, because in the Bible we learn the plan and the very purpose of God. We get gold here, spiritual gold. The word of God will build a strong, godly life and strong, godly character. I don't know about you, I'm concerned with our world today. I carry a burden for the darkness and the confusion that I see in so many lives. The God of this world, the Bible says, the God of this world has blinded the minds of those that don't know Jesus. There's a darkness over them. There's a spiritual darkness over our world today. But when, when the word of God comes in, it opens our hearts. It opens our mind to what the Lord's plan is. Notice in, notice in the text here, in verse 3, it says, it says here, Proverbs 3 and 3, it talks about the word of God. Not, don't forget the teaching, but notice what happens. Let love and faithfulness never leave you. Bind them around your neck. Write them on the tablet of your heart. Now, notice what he's talking about here. What, what amazing imagery here. When Moses, when the Lord made the Ten Commandments, he carved those Ten Commandments in. He engraved them with the finger of God, it says. Do you see the imagery here? We're not talking about a shallow experience. 
Do you see what God wants in our lives? He doesn't want us just to come to the front and, 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 and mimic a prayer. Say this prayer. And it may be a good prayer. And then we walk out and say, yeah, I'm good. Got my insurance policy. When we meet Jesus, God starts working in our lives through his word. He wants to engrave his character in our hearts. He wants it to be so deep that, that, what does it say here? That love and faithfulness is engraved on the tablets of our hearts. When Jesus saves us, he does a deep work in our lives. And he says, let love and, mer- let love and faithfulness not leave you, but write them there. Let, in other words, let this become a part of your character. Become the person that God wants you to be through the word of God and through the power of the Holy Spirit, faithfulness and love. Being a person that loves God and that loves others and loves your family and be a person of faithful. And, and one translation says truth, true, truth and faithfulness. These are words that all go together in a world of crookedness. Be a truthful person. Be a person that speaks the truth. Be a person that lives the truth. Don't live a double life. Be the person in the dark as you are in the light. Can I hear an amen? And the Bible says as we apply the word of God, don't let truth leave you. Don't forget my teachings, the the writer says. Don't forget my commands. Don't ever let them go. Let them be a part of your whole life. And what happens is when we build our life on the truth of God's word, we build a strong life that that the storms of life cannot blow away. I, I think there's a parable about that, isn't there? Jesus said, he who hears my word and applies my word and obeys my word He said, it's like building a house on the rock. And the winds came and the storms blew, but the house remained because it was solid. It was built on the truth of God. It was engraved in our lives. But then there's another category. Those who hear the word but don't obey it. Nothing got ever engraved upon their hearts. And it says that that person also experienced storms, but the word says that their, their house crashed with a great crash. Because it was founded on the sand. And and the message is this today. The message is, if we're going to walk in the wisdom of God, if we experience the blessing of God, if we're going to have a solid life, that when we go through storms, difficulties, and problems, that we're not going to be blown over, we have to build our lives on the truth of God's word. Can I hear an amen? Amen. Learn God's truth. Here's the second thing. It's found in verse 5 through 8. And I would capsulize it this way. Not only do we need to learn the truth of God, we we need to obey the will of God. We have to obey the will of God. Now, it says here in, in verse 5 and 6, it says, He shall direct your paths. Now, we want that, don't we? Don't you want God to guide you into his best and guide you into his will and guide you and, and, and have that kind of life of, of his God? We all want that. But, but, but the words, the words, he shall direct your path is predicated on obedience, because when it says, trust the Lord, trust in the Lord with all your heart, what it's basically saying is, live a life of obedience. Now, as I said, we, we, we often we read of the blessings. We go, oh, I want those blessings. Oh, yes, Pastor, I want those blessings. But what it's talking about here in, in Romans, I think, illustrates this. Romans 12 and 1 Trusting in the Lord with all your heart is a life of complete surrender. And notice what Romans says. Therefore, I urge you, and I'm urging you today, and I'm urging Dakota, and I'm urging all of us today. Paul says, therefore, I urge you, brothers and sisters, in view of God's mercy, to offer your bodies as a living sacrifice Holy and pleasing to God. This is, this is your true and proper worship. To surrender your life to God in a life of obedience. That This is worship in spirit and in truth is what it is. Do not conform. Do not conform to the pattern of this world. But be transformed by the renewing of your mind. That you may be able to test and approve what God's will is. That wisdom we're walking in. His good, pleasing, and perfect will. Hallelujah. Isn't that wonderful? You know what trust is in this text in Proverbs 3? The word trust means to lie, 
to lie helpless face down. It really means just to, to prostrate yourself. And, and the picture is of a servant lying face down, waiting for the master's command, waiting to know what to do. It's a picture of a soldier that is yielding himself to a conquering general. And here's what all of our problem is. And every one of us have this temptation. Every one of us have this danger. And that is what the text says. Do not lean to your own understanding. Because you know what happens when we don't trust in the Lord, when we don't submit to him, and when we don't acknowledge him, what's happened is we, it comes in, we start leaning on our own human wisdom, and, and yes, we have common sense, and yes, the Lord does, not, does want us to use common sense. He gives us, he gives us a natural wisdom to use. He doesn't want us to be foolish, but what he's talking about here is this. He's talking about people who trust in themselves, which we would call P-R-I-D-E. We would call that pride. They trust in themselves. They don't look to God. They're not seeking God. They're not yielding to God. They're not walking in his wisdom. They're not acknowledging him and seeing what his plan, purpose, and will is. And then what happens is it's the tragedy of missing out on the will of God. Missing God's plan. Can you imagine living all of your life outside the will of God, outside of God's purpose and plan? And, and so what this is, don't lean to your own understanding. It's like a little caution, the, the wisdom uh, the Solomon gives us. And it's a caution not to depend on your wisdom, not depend on past experience and say, you know, I've got this. Because if, you're, if you'll look at this, here's what the world has done. They've laid aside the wisdom of God. Proverb, or rather, Romans 1 tells us what this world has done. Paul's giving an illustration of the pagan world, but it's our world too. It's what's happening today. Notice what notice what Romans 1 22. And I'll read through 25. Romans 1, verse 22 says. 122 says, although they claim to be wise. They became fools, thought they were so smart, but yet they became so foolish. It says, and exchanged the glory of the immortal God for images made like a mortal human being or birds or animals or reptiles. Therefore, God gave them over to sinful desires of their hearts, to sexual impurity for the degrading of their bodies with one another. Notice this. Listen closely. Here's what they did, and here's what's happening in our world today. They exchanged the truth about God for a lie. And worshiped and served the created things rather than the creator who is praised forever. Amen. In other words, here's what the, here's what the ancient world did, and here's what's happening today. People have exalted their own human viewpoint. They've exalted their own human intellect above the very wisdom and truth of God's holy word. And when we lift our human intellect above the very word of God, then we go down, 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 far, far away from God. And that's what's happening today in our world. Amen. People are going far away from God because they've gone far away from God's word. They've gone far away from the wisdom of God. They've gone far away from the word of God. I caution us all today. I would caution me. I would caution Dakota. I would caution all of us to be careful not to lean to our own understanding. Don't lean on your own experience, even though it may be a good past experience. We have to always acknowledge the Lord. We have to always submit to his plans and will. We have to always wait before him and say, Lord, what do you want to do? I've, I've even had people in church before. I've had even staff members, I think, why I was moving slowly. They wanted me to move quicker because I was waiting on the Lord and his wisdom and not theirs. Abraham went down to Egypt in Genesis 12. Abraham was God's, he's the father of our faith. Abraham, Abraham's name has been made great. No one here could name anyone, humanly speaking. No one in this room could name anyone 
that's ever lived in the human race greater than Abraham. You can't name one because there is not one. God said in Genesis 12, he said, I'll make your name great. You name me someone today who is revered by Christians, revered by Jews, revered by Muslims. His name is Abraham. And yet Abraham, we have a little epoch in his life where Abraham leaned to his own understanding. There was famine in the promised land, so he decided to go down to Egypt for a while. I doubt very seriously he consulted the Lord. He gets close to Egypt, and he says, You know, Sarah, you're a beautiful woman. And I, I imagine, see his own understanding, I imagine that you're going to, we're going to go down here, and they're going to see how beautiful you are, and they're going to realize that, that if they kill me, they can have you, basically, is the situation. So Sarah, I tell you what, why don't you just say that you're my sister? So, and he basically is telling a half truth, but a half truth is a whole and gets down there and gets everybody in trouble. And, and her, the whole situation goes upside down. I won't go into all of it, but what do we see here? We see him leaning to his own understanding instead of seeking and acknowledging God. And following the wisdom of the Lord. See, we not only need to know the truth of God, we need to obey the will of God. And when, when, when Joshua, when he, when he they, had, they had gained a great victory at Jericho. I've been to Jericho. I've actually been to Jericho. It is an ugly little place, by the way. No, really. You think Jericho. No, it's terrible looking. It's a terrible little place. But Joshua and Israel, through a miracle of God, marched around those walls, and the walls fell down. And God gave them a great victory. Do you know some of the greatest, the most dangerous times in our lives is right after success? He comes to the next battle at Ai, a little town. They didn't, even, they didn't consult the Lord. They just, with their own understanding, said, you know, it's just a small town, two, three, th 3,000, just go. And they were routed by this little enemy. They were routed. They came into defeat because when we lean to our own understanding, we don't walk in the word of God and the wisdom of God and the will of God, we're headed for a fall. We're headed for a defeat and not a victory. Right. And Joshua falls on the ground and says, oh. Lord, we've come over here and look the, with all these enemies around us and they're going to hear that we've lost. And, they, you know, he's imagining all these things. And you know what the Lord tells him? Get up. That's right. And that tells me this. There's some things we need to pray about, but there's some times when the prayer meeting needs to end and we got to deal with it. There we go. Right? There's some things that you, you can't pray over disobedience. you got to repent. And he said, Joshua, get up. There's sin in the camp. You've got to get right with me. You've got to get your heart right. That was the wisdom of God, repent. And they repented. They got the sin out. They defeated the enemy, and they, they in, 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 eventually inherited the land and possessed the land. What, what's the point here? The point is we've got to not lean to our own understanding. So what's God's, what's God's conditions to receiving his blessing? One is learn the truth of God. Learn the word of God. Learn the will of God through his word. Also, obey the will of God. But here's the third thing, and we'll just touch briefly on this. Verse 9 and 10 talks about being generous, being generous with what God has given us. You know, I hear a lot about, you know, a lot of this, the people divide, the, divide things up into spiritual and material. Oh, you know, that church stuff, that's the spiritual stuff. Oh, but what we do is the material, and we divide all this stuff up. Can I tell you this? Hear me. Are you listening? Say amen. With the Christian, there's no such thing as material and spiritual. It's all spiritual. Because when we receive Christ as our Lord, he becomes Lord of everything. The, the material and the spiritual and everything as we surrender our hearts and our lives to him. Everything is his. We are his. And he is the Lord over our lives. In Exodus 13, 1 and 2, I won't, I won't go there for time's sake. But I'll just tell you that in Old Testament Israel, the Jews brought the firstlings. The first of the flock. They bought the first. This was a, this was a perpetual statute that the, the, the first one born was to be offered to the Lord. Leviticus 23, 9 through 14. It says they were to bring the first fruits of their field. The very first part. The very best part. How I many know God deserves our best? 
Jesus, the Lord, our Father gave us Jesus. He, they, he gave us the best. He gave us the very Son of God to die and take the penalty for our sins. And he says, I want the first fruits. And this is a pattern in Israel. The firstling of the flock and the first of the harvest every year went to the Lord. And that was, what was that about? What was that about? That was about several things. One, it was about acknowledging the goodness of the Lord. But it also was the acknowledgement of God's sovereignty over the lives of his people. Do you know there's a parallel in the New Testament? You know what it is? It's Matthew 6.33. Remember that? Matthew 6.33. Look on the screen here. Matthew 6.33. Here's that Old Testament. Here's the, the parallel to the Old Testament. But seek first the kingdom of his kingdom and his righteousness. And all these things will be given to you as well. The truth is, if we're not faithful to give to the Lord, if we're not faithful in this area of giving, we're not really trusting the Lord. See, here's the thing we need to know. We're not paying God for his blessing. That has nothing to do with it. What it is, it's an, it's an attitude and an action of faith and obedience to the Lord. It is an evidence of who is in control of our finances. And if we're going to have the blessing of God, we have to meet the conditions of God, which is know the truth of God, walk in the will of God, and be generous with what the Lord has given us. Now, there's a fourth little condition, and we'll get to the blessing. We'll land on the blessings. And that's this. In verse 11 and 12, read it again. In, verse, in Proverbs 3, 11 and 12, My son, do not despise the Lord's discipline, and do not resent his rebuke, because the Lord disciplines those he loves as a father of the son he delights in. You want to have the blessing of the Lord and then submit to his chastisement. Submit to his, we can say it this way, submit to his discipline. Chastisement means discipline. And I, I want to be clear with you here. Discipline is a part of the Christian life. And what the word of God pictures as chastisement or discipline, the Lord says in Hebrews, it says when we go through trials and storms and difficulties in our lives, in every Christian will, will. I know there's doctors out there that if you're going through any problems that somehow you're out of the will of God. I'm here to tell you if you're in a problem, you're probably right in the middle of the will of God. Because God says his chastisement, which are the storms and trials that he allows us to go through, are his discipline. And his discipline is what? See, we go through a storm. Now listen, this is, how, this is how messed up we are in our minds. And this is why we need the wisdom of God. This is why we need the word of God. This is why we have the mind of Christ. And we need to see our lives from God's vantage point. And we see God's will and vantage point as we look through the lens and we put on gospel glasses. So here's what happens. We go through a storm, a trial, and a difficulty. And we say this, don't you love me, God? Why are you allowing me to go through this, Lord? And you know what the Bible says? The Bible says the complete opposite. The Bible says that his chastisement in our lives, his discipline in our lives, is a sign of his love. So in other words, it's not that he doesn't love us. He's chastising us because he cares for us. He cares for who we are. He cares for our lives now in time. And he also cares for where we're going to spend eternity. And the Lord allows us to go through trials and storms and difficulties so that we can become the people that he desires for us to be. So that he can engrave in our lives love and truth and faithfulness. And the Hebrew says so that we can be partakers of his holiness. So when we walk in the wisdom of God, and we walk in the will of God, and we become those people that God wants us to be, you will go through storms. Dakota, you will go through storms. And those storms are part of God's loving us and molding us into the people that he desires us to be. And we can't fight against that. We can't tempt God by blaming him. But we have to surrender to him. Now notice this. God's discipline may be painful, 
but it's always good for us. In the book of Deuteronomy, chapter 8, Deuteronomy 8 in verse 2, here's what it said. Here's what the Lord said to Israel of why he allowed them to be disciplined. Why he allowed them to go through storms. This is Deuteronomy 8 and verse 2. Remember how the Lord your God led you all the way in the wilderness these 40 years to humble and to test you in order, that, in order to know what was in your heart. See, God was doing a deeper work in them. The Lord wasn't just trying to make them comfortable. Sometimes he was causing difficulty and making it very uncomfortable. But look at this. Whether or not you would keep his commands, he humbled you. And he caused you to hunger. But that was uncomfortable. But why did he cause them to hunger? Notice this. And then feeding you with manna, which neither you nor your ancestors have known, to teach you that man does not live by bread alone, but every word that comes from the mouth of the Lord. He clothed you. Your clothes didn't wear out. Your feet did not swell during the 40 years. Know then that the Lord, know then, know then that in your heart, that as a man disciplines his son, the Lord the Lord your God disciplines you. To see how God's working in their lives, they went through hunger, and then all of a sudden, God revealed the manna to them. God was working. That discipline is always good for us. So here's, let's land with the blessings. So pastor, if I walk in the wisdom of God, if I meet these conditions, what are some of the blessings? And we want to land on these blessings today. Do you want the blessing? Come on. One of the blessings that God has planned is what I would just call, maybe we could call it true wealth. And in verse 13 of Proverbs 3, we read these words. Blessed is the man who finds wisdom, those who gain understanding. And then pictures her as a, a wise woman. For she is more profitable than silver. And yields better returns than gold. She is more precious. Everyone say more precious. She's more precious than rubies. Nothing you, can de nothing you desire can compare with her. One of, the, one of the blessings of walking in the wisdom of God and meeting his commands is you, you gain true wealth by the wisdom of God. You really gain real wisdom from heaven. It's been said that some people know the price of everything and the value of nothing. Now, I would be the first to say, because the Word of God says it, God will bless you material with things. The Lord has promised blessing. I read that to you. Trust him, uh, uh, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things will be added unto you. How many of you in this room, now, you don't have to say an amen, you don't have to raise your hand, but just think how the Lord has blessed you. I'm talking about material things now. You know, probably the person in this room that has the least of anyone in here is more blessed than most of the people on the face of the earth today. In America, we have experienced amazing wealth and amazing blessing. You know, that in Timothy, Paul said this, the Lord gives us all good things to enjoy. There's nothing wrong with the blessing of the Lord in a material way. But there is a problem, and there, and there is a great danger. And do you realize that the Lord, in His Word, speaks more about the, it warns more about the dangers than talks about the material blessings? And here's the, here's the issue, and the problem is this the problem is people make a God out of things. Because you realize that wealth becomes a God. Most of the time, wealth changes people. Now, I don't think any of us in here would qualify as wealthy. If you're due, you're hiding it. <laughs> We're just common folks here, and that's fine. But I do have a dear friend that is incredibly wealthy. I'm not talking about a million dollars either. That's chump change. He is fabulously wealthy. And it's an amazing thing to me because wealth changes most people. But he has remained a holy, godly man of integrity. It's an amazing thing.
And he loves Jesus with all of his heart, truly, truly a godly man. But Jesus warned us. He said, you cannot serve God in money. Either you love the one and hate the other, or you hate the one and love the other. You can't serve God in mammon. He warned us about those things. What I would say today is this. One of the blessings of meeting God's conditions is this. You gain what money cannot buy. You gain true wealth. You gain, you gain and not gain like we earn it, but we, we walk in a relationship with God. Do you understand that the world looks on us with scorn? The world looks on us and they, why in the world they gather in that building to hear that crazy old dusty book? Well, this is not the dusty old book. This is the very wealth of God. This is the very wisdom of God. They don't even know how wealthy we are. We have something money can't buy. We have a relationship with Jesus. Our sins are washed away. Our names are written down in heaven. We have a peace that they try to get through alcohol and drugs and, and, and pleasure seeking. But we have the precious Holy Spirit in our hearts. What a blessing. Peace. We have joy, honor, and length of days. We have things money can't buy. What a blessing. Here's another thing that Walking in these conditions is here's something interesting, and, and you may wonder why it's there. Look at verse 19 and 20, and we're about to land this. Verse 19 and 20, it says, By wisdom, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundation. Look at that. By, the, by wisdom, the Lord laid the earth's foundations. By understanding, he set the heavens in place. By his knowledge, the watery depths were divided, and the clouds let dew drop. Here's another benefit and blessing, and I would just call it this, a life of harmony. A life of harmony. God created this world. This is his world. I know we're messing it up as human beings, but it's, it's his world. And when God, the, the Bible in Genesis 1, Genesis 2, talks about all the chaos it talks about the darkness, and the, it was a chaotic earth. And I'm paraphrasing, of course. It was the chaotic earth, and all of a sudden, God spoke, and, and the Spirit of God was hovering. In Genesis 1, one of the messages we have in the majesty and the glory of creation is everything began to come together. The sun, the moon, the stars, everything came together in harmony. I know Genesis 3 damaged that a lot. But think, think about this. Think, think with me. Think about that. Do you realize that the order of creation, what they call the fine-tuning of the universe, this is one of the most powerful witnesses to atheists, and it's, it's, it messes them up. It really does. I've heard, I've heard Christopher Hitchens, which is he's passed away now. He was an atheist. And, and Richard Dawkins, which is another famous atheist, when they begin to be confronted with the fine-tuning of the universe, it stumbles them. It's, he's, I think one of them even said, you know, if I ever believed in God, that would be the reason. Do you realize how fine-tuned the universe is? That if it was off a little bit this way or a little bit that way, we wouldn't even exist today. What does that fine-tuning of the universe tell us? It tells us there is a God. It tells us there's a God who loves us and has a plan for our lives. And do you realize one of the blessings, it talks about creation here, when God brought it all together. Do you realize when we come into the Lordship of Jesus, when we acknowledge him and we trust in him, when we walk in his wisdom, all of a sudden our life comes into harmony and we begin to live the kind of life on this earth that he wants us to live. You ever notice how chaotic people's lives are? How many divorces? Christians can't even stay divorced. That's one of the tragedies, one of the amazing tragedies of the modern church, of how we have been inundated with divorce. How can two people that love Jesus not stay together? I heard an old man say one time, an old man, I heard an old man said, he said, I was 21 years old before I ever even heard of one, someone getting a divorce. It's one of the terrible spiritual tragedies of our day. Look at how, 
how chaotic people are, drug addiction, emotional problems, and all of this points that people are not in harmony with God. People are not in harmony with his will in their lives. One of the blessings is a life of harmony. Like God spoke the world into existence. He fine-tuned the universe. How many know he can fine-tune our lives? Now, would, I, one more thing, and then we're done, and we'll pray. The last blessing, I told you to give you four conditions, four blessings. The last is just God's care, God's providential care, the Father's care. Look, look what happens when we walk in acknowledgement of God, walking in his wisdom. Verse 21, we'll read 21 to 26, and I mean, we'll pray. My son, do not let wisdom and understanding out of your sight. Preserve sound judgment and discretion. They will be life for you, an ornament of grace to grace your neck. Then you will go, then you will go your way in safety, and your foot will not stumble. You will lie down, and you will not be afraid. You will lie down, your sleep will be sweet. Have no fear of sudden disaster or of the ruin, ruin that overtakes the wicked. For the Lord will be at your side and will keep your foot from being snared. Man, This is what happens when we choose God's wisdom. All right, I want you to stand. Now, Dakota, I know we prayed for you, and I'm not going to make you come down here and hawk over you. But, but we want to pray for all of us today. And, and Dakota, I, I really did want to sit you right here today, son. I wanted to put him right there, but I know that would be awkward. But I pray that you'll take these words I've said today. I'm proud of you. I have known you most of your life. I know when you were when a man child. I call him a man child all of your life. Well, that's true, all of your life. That's right. I call him a man child because he used to be about this big, and now he's a man's man. And, uh, and we are very proud of you. If you'll take Proverbs 3 and take these principles, they will guide you into God's will. They will protect you. And through all of life, you will have God's very best. Maybe you're here today and you have things in your life, decisions to make. And you need God's wisdom. The Bible said, trust in the Lord with all your heart. Lean not to your own understanding and all of your ways acknowledge him. He will direct your paths. Listen, dear ones, there is an answer for the problems you have. And the Lord wants to help you. He is your helper. You don't have to be afraid. I read that to you. You, you don't have to be afraid. Your sleep is going to be sweet. All the anxiety, all the worry needs to be gone. Amen? And we can rest in our gracious Heavenly Father. Today, oh God, thank you for this chapter. It's a beautiful chapter. We apply it to our lives. We apply it to Dakota. And I ask you, oh God, help us to meet these conditions because we don't want to be like a, someone looking in a window and, and window shopping and saying, I wish I had that. But Lord, we want to experience these blessings. We want to experience your wisdom and your help and your blessing and your prosperity. We want to experience your usefulness. We want to experience your fatherly care. So right now, Lord, as the word trust means to lay prostrate. Lord, each of us today... And, and saints, I pray that as I pray this prayer, that you'll pray this in your heart. That today, oh Lord, we prostrate our hearts before you. We don't lean to our own wisdom. We don't lean to our own human intellect. But we always want to be a church that follows your plan, your purpose, and your will. Father, I pray for those today in this room that maybe are facing difficult decisions. I pray that you'd grant them your understanding. Lord, that you would grant them your wisdom and that you'd lead us in a smooth path. Some of you today, church, some of you today have some rocky areas of your life. And it's because you've been leaning to your own understanding. You've been trying to figure it out on your own. But today, the Lord says, trust him. And don't lean to your own understanding. Acknowledge him. Acknowledge him as your Lord, as your leader, as your helper. Pray to him. Seek him. Search his word like you search for gold. And the Lord will make your path smooth. He'll make your path straight. He'll show you the way out of where you're going because he loves you. So, Lord, today I ask your blessing on this word. May it not be something we get away from quickly, 
But Lord, may you give us grace, give us multiplied mercy, and be with us each today. And we ask these things in Jesus' great name. Everybody said amen.